Well, welcome. Thanks for joining us for the fifth in our um, lecture series about um, rural-urban connections, exploring the inextricable links between rural and urban communities. Uh, my name is Jenny Duvander. I'm the Communications Director with the Institute for Sustainable Solutions. Um, we are the um, cross-campus hub for sustainability here on campus, um, working on sustainability academics, uh, solutions-oriented research, and also um, convening partners and um, dialogues like the one we're gathered for here today. So we're very pleased that you can join us. Um, we've left some questions, uh, time for questions after the talk. Please come up to the microphone um, because the video will pick up your voice that way and also uh, the video will be available on our websites um, within the next couple of days so you can share it with your friends. Um, for you social media hounds, we're uh, tweeting with the hashtag rural urban, all one word. Um, so you can join the conversation on Twitter. And also please add your name to the basket uh, for a chance to win door prizes and we'll add you to um, an email list to get notified about future events like this. And now, uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Martin Goebel, who is the president of Sustainable Northwest. They're our partner in uh, this lecture series and he can tell you more about this wonderful organization. I'm gonna be very brief, but I'd love to invite you all, sitting in the back especially, to move up if you can. That way we can make this thing a little bit more intimate. You don't have to be so far back, so. That way, you know, we work in rural communities and everything's very intimate in rural communities, so let's act like one. So, uh, like Jenny said, I'm Martin Goebel. I'm um, the president of Sustainable Northwest, and We've uh, been really delighted to be part of this partnership with PSU and the Institute for Sustainable Solutions. Uh, what we do at Sustainable Northwest is to build partnerships with rural communities to help them transition through uh, unsustainable, from sustain unsustainable economies to sustainable economies. And that often implies building collaboration between and among interest groups, sometimes conflicted and conflicted, uh, conflicting interest groups and interests. and. Uh, building local community capacity, as you will listen to in just a few minutes, and um, and then trying very hard as they begin to implement projects that that demonstrate that environment and economy can coexist and work hand in hand. We help build enterprises that um, that mean something tangibly to people locally, and to us urbanites tangibly as well as they begin to produce and sell services and goods to us here in rural. In, in urban communities. Um, as, uh, while I'm at that, there's an event coming up August 9th, our own events called Bioenergy and Beer. So for any of you who'd like to come to our Bioenergy and Beer event, it's gonna be right across the river near OMSI. We have a warehouse that actually sells sustainable wood from the very rural communities that you're gonna be hearing a little bit about. And so we'll have plenty of beer. We'll talk a lot about wood and energy and how rural and urban communities, in fact, in very tangible ways, link together. Uh, over on that table, there's lots of materials about the Institute for Sustainable Solutions and about Sustainable Northwest and about the speakers who are speaking tonight. I'll point out that uh, the organization Northwest Connections has a couple flyers here on their courses. They're excellent, and it's a beautiful place. In fact, we're working in rural communities is a beautiful thing. Um, and most of them are absolutely gorgeous places, and the two speakers tonight represent beautiful communities, b beautiful people, and really in innovative solutions to environment and economic development. So I'm gonna introduce Maya Inzer, who is our Director for Policy and Communities at Sustainable Northwest. She's gonna introduce our speakers and moderate uh, their program. So thank you very much for showing up tonight, and I hope you get a lot out of it and ask a lot of good questions. Last time we were here, the, the mayor twittered a question. So be aware. Thanks. So Neil from Mallory, do you want to come on up while I introduce you? <laughs> Just be quiet, Lynn. This is a family event. So my name's Maya Enzer. I'm the Policy Director at Sustainable Northwest, and I'm very happy to be able to introduce both Melanie and Nils. I will give you their official uh, credentials in a minute, but I'll just say that I um, have known both of these people for a little bit more than a decade, I believe. And they are the kind of people that make what I do at my job worthwhile. 
These are the most innovative frontier people that are actually changing the way things are happening in the American West. Um, and so they really are, I think, the future of where our country's going. So I'm really happy that they were willing to travel so far and to come to Portland to talk about the work that they're doing. Um, so I'll start with Nils. Uh, that's the guy at the end of the table. Um, Nils moved to Wallowa County in 1999, and he initiated the Wallowa Resources field program there, taking them you know, out on the ground, everything from forest restoration uh, to rangeland restoration. He became their deputy director in 2002 and their executive director in 2007. Um, Nils has also worked with local communities prior to coming to Oregon. He's worked internationally and lived internationally for a good part of his career. And so we're very, very lucky to have him in Oregon and I think lucky to have him um, in the West in general uh, supporting this field. So he has worked um, on ranching in Australia, farming in Israel, fishing and forestry in Norway, and forestry and wildlife in Southern Africa. He graduated Williams College um, and Oxford University and he serves on a bunch of national boards. He's on the school board, Enterprise School Board, and is on the National Commission of Science and Sustainable Forestry. He's also chaired our governor's um, Eastside Forest Advisory Panel that was under Governor Kulangelski, and he is currently on our, the Oregon Department of Forestry. So it's really amazing to have Nils here talking about the on-the-ground work that he does. Melanie um, is coming all the way from the Swan Valley of Montana, which is a beautiful place, and she's going to show you pictures, so I'm not going to get into the details of how nice it is there. Um, she's the founding executive director of a group called Northwest Connections. Um, this is a group that does everything from education with college students to working with the community, businesses, um, working with the Forest Service, large landscape scale restoration work, um, she has a master's degree in environmental studies from the University of Montana. She's taught field-based ecology courses for more than 20 years um, and has done everything from being a backcountry ranger, wilderness guide, and field ecologist. Um, Melanie is one of the biggest advocates of, of place-based conservation. She is both, actually, Nils and Melanie serve on the steering committee for the Rural Voices for Conservation Coalition, which is a west-wide coalition promoting that intersection of environmental and economic development in rural communities across the west. So they both have walked the halls of Congress, met with many people in this administration and previous administrations. So they work all the way from the on the ground, kicking dirt, up to state, federal, regional policy organization. So, um, Without further ado, I'm going to let them do their show. I think each one of them is going to talk for, did you say 25 minutes each? And then we will open it up for conversation. Um, and it's, these have been very informal. I will try to moderate. Um, I will just remind you guys a couple things. When you have, if you have questions, write them down. Because what we'll do is have people come up to the microphone and ask questions from the microphone. Uh, and also really do put your card in there so that we can follow up and you can get copies of their PowerPoint presentations and help distribute and spread the word about this good work. So why don't you give them a welcome? Thank you. Okay, what do I do? <laughs> help. <laughs> This one, yeah. Help. Help someone. I'm serious. <laughs> no, I just need technological assistance. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, so um, here I am. So my name is Melanie Parker, like Maya said, and I live in this place and started this organization, Northwest Connections, and this year is our 15th anniversary, so that's the mark that we're at. Um, and that's kind of our tagline, and it, it might sound familiar, all things are connected, the land, the animals, and the people, but um, it goes pretty deep for us, so I'll kind of get into that. 
Northwest Connections is an organization, um, I'll just say from the get-go, we, um, I like to say we have our boots on the ground and our head in the clouds. So we think of ourselves as a local organization, but we also um, increasingly think of ourselves as an organization that can and does and should catalyze change at larger scales. So I'll talk a little bit about what we do locally, but with always that in the back of our minds. So Patrick, who invited Nils and I to talk, gave us this theme, Rural Urban Connections. And so I, I had to just think, OK, Rural Urban Connections. I'm in Portland, Rural Urban Connections. And I was like, for God's sake, of course we're connected, right? So just Monday, I was at a community meeting where we were grappling with the new critical habitat designation of bull trout. So I just happened to have this map on my computer, <clears throat> and I was looking at it. I was like, wow, here's Portland. And here's where I live, right? So tiny little Buck Creek in Swan Valley, Montana, that watershed, we are basically, both Nils and I, are your watershed, your headwaters communities. We, we are the folks that are living, stewarding, and doing our best up in the headwaters, and we're very much connected with what you all care about and are doing down here in Portland. So hopefully that will come a little bit clearer. I should also say the reason I chose this map instead of just a general watershed map is that truly threatened and endangered species, something that our nation cares about, something that the Endangered Species Act, you know, a great law that was passed to, to keep species from going into extinction, it has some really interesting unintended effects on rural communities and it's something that our communities um, grapple with on a daily basis. So critical habitat for bull trout is a big thing for us. We love bull trout. We also uh, are looking for some flexibilities. But we don't just have bull trout, we have a few other um, threatened and endangered species. So in the Swan Valley, which I'll show you pictures in a, in a while, but it's a, a mountainous part of the Rocky Mountains. It's contiguously forested, lots of wetlands. Um, amazing, beautiful place, and we are the home to the largest uh, intact population of lynx um, in the lower 48. We have our pine marten, we have wolverine. These are two grizzly bears in my mother's front yard. Um, so we are coexisting with these threatened and endangered species and trying to figure out as a community, and increasingly, of course, we have wolves on the landscape, um, what does that mean, right? And how do we do that? So. What do we do? Well, what we tell ourselves that we do is we do place-based collaborative conservation. I know it's really sexy, but place-based collaborative conservation. So it's all about the place, and we do a lot of this. And what is the this? The this, right, Lynn, we stand around in circles. We stand around in circles out on the land. Who do we stand around in circles with out on the land over and over and over again? We stand around in circles out on the land with everybody that we can think of that cares about that place. And so Patrick asked us to talk about our brand of environmentalism, our brand of conservation. And sort of what I came to in thinking about this is so much of what, what's different about environmentalism in our headwaters communities is that we truly have to, we have to, in order to live in our communities, we have to talk to people that we completely disagree with. <laughs> True? <laughs> and so we do a lot of this kick in the dirt, standing around in circles. But the cool thing about the standing around in the circles, it's, you notice I didn't put a meeting room up there. We do sit in a lot of meetings. But the transformative power of being, and this is the one thing that rural communities can grapple around. We can hate each other over wolves, over religion, over uh, a whole number of things. But we typically, mostly, all love the place. So the power of what we do is always bringing people back to place. So uh, collaborative place-based conservation. So why do we do it? We do it because we just woke up one morning and said, wow, that sounds like a fun thing to do. Let's stand around in circles and kick the dirt. No, we do it because we were driven to do it out of conflict, controversy, and um, basically our communities and our landscapes being ripped apart. And so this graph here, is just a, a quick graph. I live on the Flathead National Forest, and the Flathead National Forest, this is from, uh, where, I think I have a pointer. Is red pointer? I'm not going to do anything bad. OK, good. Um, so we went from 100 million board feet um, up to about 150 million board feet in the 70s, sort of leveled off through the 80s here. And then look at this. By the year 2000, 
instead of 150 million board feet, we were cutting about 2.5 million board feet. So what do you think that means if your family is based on logging receipts, right? Total economic crunch collapse. Um, so we, the reason we sit around talking, trying to find the middle ground is that our communities were thrown into utter chaos and breakdown by economic collapse. And then this photo, that's the Swan Valley. I'll get to the beautiful part in a minute, but that's the Swan Valley. We're checkerboard ownership. I won't go into what that means, but every other square mile was essentially railroad land, right? Some of you guys are familiar with it, so corporate timberland. Um, and so we were also thrown into disarray because in the 80s, our corporate partners liquidated the forest. So, and that's part of what drove the environmental concern, which is part of what drove the economic collapse on the federal lands. And so essentially our community just said, oh my God, that's our two options. Basically, you can cut us out of a job. The, the timber company was telling us, you will have no logs in 2002 and you won't have them again for 30 years on our, on our footprint. Or um, you can preserve us out of a job and say, this place is really important for grizzly bears, therefore you can't do anything, ever. And so we said, there's got to be a better way. So um, here we are. This is just to geographically orient you. So this is Idaho, Montana. Um, this is the greater Yellowstone. We call ourselves now the crown of the continent. It was a little marketing ploy, and it's working out well for us. I highly suggest it. Um, before we were like, you know, the greater Bob Marshall wilderness or something, and it didn't work. Um, so there's our community, and as you'll see, we're located, the red dot is the Swan Valley. We're located between two wilderness areas and just to the south of Glacier National Park. And so we really wanted a conservation strategy for ourselves that wasn't either, one of the two things we see in the West is either you can protect it, we could become a wilderness or a park, or we could exploit it and we could become completely developed. And those were the only two options the external partners were offering us. And so we said, there's got to be a better way. So once we started on this, uh, there's got to be a better way story, we, we s stood around and talked about what's important to us. And one of the things that really emerged, um, and Aaron will resonate with this, but one of the things that really emerged was local knowledge. So um, this is indigenous knowledge and tribal knowledge as well. So I don't want to, I'm not uh, excluding that. So we, we work uh, hand in hand with our tribes across the mountains. Um, we don't have tribes right in the Swan Valley. But increasingly what we're looking at is um, folks like this. So this is actually in a partner community. The fellow there is a guy named Dave Ellis. Um, he's down in Salmon, Idaho. And this is some of our Northwest Connection students talking to Dave. Dave is fifth generation rancher in Salmon, Idaho. The guy knows holistic ranching, right? He gets this stuff. He, he came to it like better than anybody that's ever written a textbook on it. So finding it is my, you know, basically tapping into it. We knew we had to tap into our own knowledge of places. Um, and then the second slide is some of our Northwest Connection students doing amphibian monitoring. And the idea, in fact, are any of you in that picture? No, OK. Um, uh, the idea there is you don't just tap into local knowledge. It's not static. It actually dies. People move, people die. You have to recreate local knowledge. So we are in the business of trying to both tap local knowledge and, um, and recreate it. So when we said, OK, well, we know we have knowledge, but you know we don't have power. So with knowledge and no power, can you transform your community? No. So how do you get power? Well, there's probably a whole bunch of ways to get power. But the way that we thought of to get power is through partnerships. So we created um, uh, basically a robust collaborative where we invite everyone, the lit litigating environmental groups, the industry, the Forest Service, and we all sit down. And we decide what the priorities for the Swan Valley are. And so it's this thing called the Swan Lands Coordinating Committee, another sexy title. Um, uh, and you can just read there what our mission is. So when we got together about 10 years ago in the Swan um, as this formalized collaborative with all the partners, before that we were sort of collaborating amongst ourselves, trying to keep people from killing each other at the post office. Once we got all the big players in the room, we got TNC and the Forest Service and the industry and everything, we said, well, what's, what are some of our biggest um, things that we could do to transform our community into a, a beacon of sustainability and a beacon of a different way. 
Well, frankly, we just had one really glaring simple problem that we had to solve to even get off the ground. So the simple problem was that in 1864, the federal government had given every other square mile all the red checks there in our valley to the railroads. Um, and those railroads had turned to timber corporations, and those timber corporations had decided that they were done logging and they were going to sell our place off for real estate, and that was happening. And so to make a really long story short, we had to organize everybody in the room to solve that problem. So that's kind of the conservation piece of what we accomplished. About 10 years later, we did protect all that land. So all that land is now, as a community of stakeholders, we made sure that that land is now protected. Most of it is into public, uh, public ownership, some of it into private ownership with conservation easements. Yeah. Isn't that the most fascinating piece of US history ever? Um, to make a really, well, do you want me to take that now or take it later? OK, so uh, essentially, it was the way that our federal government encouraged the railroads um, and, and actually, um, uh, what's the word? Not monetized. Uh, help me out, Greg. Uh, incentivized the railroads to, to build. So they gave them land not only to put the tracks on, but land to develop, sell, sell the timber, um, sell the land to finance. The, the transcontinental railroads in the United States in the late 1800s. So that's what the origin of it was. And the real reason every other square mile, because there was robust talks in Congress about making sure that there was no monopoly for either the federal government or the, the local, cor the corporate, uh, they weren't corporations, the railroad companies. And so they did every other square mile to keep a balance of power. So it's a lot of history written about that. OK, so the bottom line that I'm saying is we got together diverse uh, people in our community to agree. That's number one. And then we access power by building coalitions upwards to, to get this um, big project done. Well, that's all good and fine. Did that solve our problem? No, that didn't solve our problem. All that means is that we're not going down the industrial exploitation route, right? So we got one half of the problem solved. Now the problem is. Nobody has jobs on those former Plum Creek Timber com Company lands, and nobody has jobs on the fe federal lands because they're all shut down for threatened endangered species. So now our community's dying. My school that I'm the school board chair of has gone from 100 students at our K-8 school to 32 students in about 12 years, okay? So we have economic crisis. So thanks to good folks like Maya Enzer and many others around the country brought us a program that we applied for and got into. So now this is a map of, um, about 1.5 million acres that we're working collaboratively, our community and two adjoining communities, to um, do restoration on. And our goal is to create 179 jobs per year for the next 10 years, right? Um, and and uh, click off some of the highest priority acres for restoration. So we're in year two of that and doing well. So we've. In our case, we probably haven't created many jobs, but we're at least maintaining jobs. And that's what's, like I said to Nils earlier, it's like stop the arterial bleed of our community. So we're having some success on that. The next thing that we decided is that, uh, or not the next thing, it's not really sequential. We did this from the start. But the idea was, if we were going to be a community that was your shining headwaters beacon or one of them for um, sustainability, wouldn't that be a great, fantastic classroom. Wouldn't people want to come there and experience that and meet our community and learn? And so these are some um, images from programs that Northwest Connections puts on. So in addition to facilitating all this collaboration and doing some job creation, we host university students. Um, and the way we think of these people, and I happen to be blessed to have two of them who just popped in Tonight, we think of them as the future leaders of this new way of doing business, collaborative place-based conservation. And, uh, and so we host them for uh, intensive field semesters where they get a whole semester full of credits to come and um, be a part of our community and study there. So um, part of our transformative theory is that uh, we can't just do it and go home. We have to have a whole next generation of people doing this kind of work. Um, and then the last piece is, um, is cr cr uh, um, connected to the jobs piece. So everyone's like, oh, you're creating jobs in restoration. 
that's awesome. We're like, no, that actually sucks. That means we're going to be out of work pretty soon because we're going to restore it. And so we've created this new initiative, which Greg here is helping us with, Swan Valley Innovations, um, to promote sustainable businesses in the Swan Valley. And interestingly enough, I was telling some folks this morning that um, some of our, we stole everything that Nils has ever done, I've stolen. Um, and so we stole a bunch of his ideas for integrated biomass and energy uh, uh, creation. Um, but in our community, geotourism, people talked about the potential for geotourism. People are really into the Swan Valley as a place for wellness and healing opportunities. Um, and then this is our, um, I just want to say this to the, our alumni, this is our cool new Northwest Connections Beck Creek garden project. So we're doing all this agriculture food stuff in our remote cold place, so, um, which is challenging. So as a sum, I've sort of come to this mantra over and over again. Conservation, it's not enough. Conservation, restoration, education, innovation. Um, and then just to underscore the fact that we work um, at different scales. And so in the upper left is a, a great mentor and friend, deceased and departed, but beloved friend of ours, Bud Moore. And this is a group of our students all sitting around um, learning from from Bud and his um, nearly 100 years on this planet um, right there in the Swan Valley. And then this is a whole bunch of our partners just this last spring, um, just across the river um, in, in Vancouver, Washington, meeting for our Rural Voices Coalition. And then there we are in Washington, DC, and look at how comfortable I look. But anyways, <laughs> that's, a whole, that's a whole different story. Um, so I just put this slide as a parting slide. I was, it, it, and I don't mean this to sound like, you know, urban communities need to provide rural communities with something. But I was just trying to think about this interconnections piece. And so I was like, well, what, what would, if we had an ask, if, if we traveled all this way and we had an ask, what would it be? So my ask, for the, for the night at least, is um, in terms of where you spend your money, not, I'm not saying spend more money. I'm just saying think of all the things that we do here in Portland or we purchase here in Portland that over time we could start to source from our surrounding, at least within 100 miles, 200 miles. You don't have to go all the way to Swan Valley, but you know, within a few hundred miles, what could you source here to Portland? And how would that put money um, uh, back into the very communities that are stewarding these upland areas? The second is, um, is a big one for me, and that is, and this is what we work with our students a lot, is we just throw them into these situations where, you know, yeah, I want to conserve the wolves, and I want to conserve the lynx, and let's just like lock it up and leave all the people out because people are evil and bad. No, let's think deeply, like how can we actually um, do both? How can we um, protect landscapes and have people on the landscape? And so as you make political decisions, really thinking about if those, there are unintended consequences of really well-intended conservation you know, uh, votes that you might make. And then the last is kind of, um, if you know me, I get a little you know, touchy-feely sometimes. So this is my touchy-feely one, which is um, rekindling our own connections. I really believe that as urban and rural people, as we rekindle our connections to our places, wherever we find ourselves, some suburb in Sacramento, wherever, rekindling those connections gives us a profound understanding for other landscapes and other people and what they're up against. So I think that um, that's kind of my parting one. So I'll just leave with a, a parting thought there um, that we are connected. We just need to start acting like it. <laughs> Thanks. I think so. Maybe. Um, this is kind of easy to follow because she's covered most of the ground that uh, I was going to do. I, I work for Willow Resources, the very northeast uh, corner of, of Oregon. Uh, we're about 2.1 million acres, uh, of which nearly 60% is the federal land, which is in green. And that's uh, Mostly the Willow Whitman National Forest that includes Oregon's largest wilderness area, the Eagle Cap Wilderness, plus the Hell's Canyon National Recreation Area, and the Wanaha uh, Wilderness, and then part of the Umatilla National Forest 
uh, up in the up in the upper left there. Um, and then the rest is uh, predominantly uh, agricultural ground, predominantly uh, ranching and hay production ground, a little bit of crop production ground. And then within, um, oh, since about the 80s, uh, uh, an emergence of uh, bronze and art and microbreweries and sort of tourism related stuff. Um, and it's a beautiful place. I'd, if, if, you, if you haven't been there, I recommend it. It's a, I've, I've, as Maya said, I've worked all over the world, and this place is a very, very special place. Um, well, our resources came about, you know, similar story as, as, uh, as Melanie's. Uh, for the previous century, uh, from about 1910 uh, through to 1999, the forest products industry, sort of natural resource production, dominated the economy, uh, with, with the forest products industry and forestry being the highest private sector payroll provider, uh, supporting you know, well over 30% of the jobs in the county uh, that really provided an underpinning for uh, a, a whole bunch of goods and services and the school community and everything else. And that all uh, collapsed in the 90s because our timber harvest followed the same tra trajectory, never quite as high as the flathead uh, numbers. We were at sort of 60, 70 million board feet and went down to uh, 900,000 for a little while, and then we've leveled off at about 4 million board feet. Um, and um, lost all the mills, lost all the jobs associated with those mills. Uh, saw a decline in our school enrollment by over 50%. The schools went down to four-day school weeks, which we're still on. Um, and you know, it's, it's had this incredible impact through, through, the, through the county. And in response to that, the county commissioners worked with community leaders and other people to figure out what to do. Uh, through that process, one of the county commissioners met Martin Goebel, uh, who had recently started uh, with the support from the then Governor Goldschmidt and Cecil Andrus, Sustainable Northwest, and they came up with this idea of helping to create community-based organizations to provide leadership in the face of this profound transformation. Right? So that's sort of how we, we came about. Um, this is our strategic approach, and it's not you know, too different than, than what you've just heard, so I won't spend a lot of time on it. Um, it's, it is about place-based uh, collaboration, place-based conservation, um, not excluding other people, but making sure that the contributions of everybody is focused on the specific context of our place. So not generalizing strategies and ideas and models from other places and try to uh, apply them willy-nilly across the landscape, looking at the specifics of our social ecological system and coming up with real solutions. Uh, it's about stewardship, so it's not about restoration, it's about long-term stewardship. That includes restoration where it's needed, but it includes ongoing management. So you're looking at the long-term ecological health and functioning of your land, but you're also specifically trying to produce goods and services that our own society needs today from these renewable natural resources. Um, a key piece for us, which gets to that, th these alternatives Melanie kept talking about, is maintaining the value of working lands. And the, maintaining the value of working lands is important in both the public lands and the private lands. Where the public lands have no societal value, we no longer invest in them. And that becomes apparent in the condition of our forests, the lack of management that leads to increasing frequency and severity of wildfires, to decadence, all, the, all of the national forests of, the eastern, of eastern Oregon and eastern Washington, mortality exceeds growth by a significant percentage. These are all forests in decline because of the legacy of past management and then the absence of ongoing management. Right? They, and, and I can go into more detail on that if you want to talk about it, but we've lost value for that land, we're debating what to do, and therefore we're not investing in it, and the roads are falling apart, the trails are falling apart, there's a thousand miles of deferred trail maintenance in Willow County, there's hundreds of block culverts, you know, there's, I mean, I could go on and on and on. Uh, the same thing on the, on the private lands. If we no longer, as a society, value, support the workforce, the infrastructure, the markets that maintains the value from 
family forest land, family range land, family farm land, there is pressure to move it to another highest and best use, right? And, and that's a fact, and that happens all across the West. And then there's this cultivation of knowledge, as, as Melanie talked about. You know, we're talking about very complex problems, complex systems for which there is always an inadequacy of science, data, knowledge, understanding, and we need to keep investing in that and keeping improving in our knowledge and understanding, so you have to keep investing. And then building the local community capacity that allows for leadership and allows us to learn from trial and error and continue to adapt as internal and external factors change. Large landscapes are really independent. And if there's anything, I, you know, this gets back to what I just was talking about. Um, the ecology, right? I mean, the wildlife doesn't stay only on the public land. And I used to have a whole bunch of pictures showing you bighorn sheep, wolves, elk, everything that's moving between the public and private land interface, right? The water cycle and the, and the water systems are moving between public and private land. The reintroduction of critical ecological processes like wildfire need to be able to act between public and private land boundaries. And, and, and if we separate these things or treat them differently like that checkerboard, we get in a, law, a serious problem in terms of large landscape scale conservation and stewardship. The workforce. The, 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 the amount of work that we have and the amount and the workforce that we have needs to have a, a continuity and consistency of work available on the public and private lands to sustain that, otherwise they move off and look for, uh, for other jobs. It needs to be valued, it needs to be paid competitive wages if they're gonna stay in that industry and if the next generation is gonna move in or if they're not gonna be looking for other ways to use their own intellectual capital and, and skills. Uh, and, you know, and, and it goes on and on, but there's huge interdependencies that I think get, get overlooked. So what is it about? It's about transformation. Melanie spoke about this over and over and over, and that's really uh, the key. You know, we've had this profound transformation. We had an old social contract between rural and rural America. Uh, we were originally the place that was going to provide the wood to house you, the fiber to, to clothe you and feed you, the meat to feed you, etc. And everybody agreed with that, and we were able to act with that social license in good faith and create really vibrant communities, right? And our community was very vibrant, right? I mean, for a long time, People invested in good homes, the teachers were paid very well, and the quality of life was very high. But that social contract has collapsed for a whole range of reasons that we don't have time to go into today. The question is, can we together, as a state, as a nation, as a region, create a new social contract that provides a new social license for which we can go out and do stewardship? and have the resources and, and support that we need to do that, and what does that look like? And under sustainable Northwest leadership with Rural Voices for Conservation Coalition, all of us have come together and created sort of a checklist of what that new social contract might look like, right? But I can tell you that we, the Melanie's group and my group, working in isolation in, in our own rural communities, we will never create that, that new social contract alone, right? It's something we have to do together. And if we don't, as we said, there's alternative trajectories, right? There will be pressure to do things in a vacuum where there is not an economic return to ranching, right? There'll be a pressure to use that land for something else. And, and even if today, in many places, Oregon land use law prevents the kind of hobby ranch, little mini five acre, 10 acre developments that you see in Idaho, parts of Montana, et cetera, that doesn't mean that that political decision is gonna stay forever. And the pressure will continue to mount to change those kinds of things in the absence of value. And there is pressure because the biggest demographic shift in America is happening from the east and mid Midwest states into the Intermountain West. And it's leading to significant transformation of acreage into residential development. A new type of vacuum, right? This gets to when we pull everybody out of the public lands, when there is no longer people working in the public lands, when the road system collapses so people aren't even driving the public lands anymore, 
right? These become places for illegal activities to take place. And the largest marijuana bust in the history of Region 6, Oregon and Washington National Forest, took place last year. I think they valued that at $26, $27 million, right? And we know from Trinity County that these guys are wicked sophisticated. They're using Google Map and they're looking for isolated places that they can do this undercover and move in. And they're doing a lot of research and they're putting a lot of time and money to find these places. And this is horrible. And this is not a joke. What's happening in Trinity County? You've got the Mexicans, the Chinese, and the Russians all in there doing this, right? And, and, and again, when I, when I worked in East Africa and Southern Africa, we saw the same thing. When we pulled communities out of the wildlife safari areas, it was the poachers that moved in. If you don't continue to invest in some kind of stewardship ethic and, and effort, and you create a vacuum, something moves in. As I said before, you know, the condition of the, of the national forests in the Blue Mountains is, is bad. Uh, we've seen a significant increase in the frequency and severity of wildfire. Uh, I think 94, the, in, in Wallowa County alone since 1989, the U.S. Forest Service has spent $150 million fighting wildfires, one county, right? If they had put 10% of that into helping us build the workforce and, and manage this place, we, we could, would have had rebuilt our community, created more jobs. Instead, we're stuck in this polarized, but what to do about the national forest, and we end up spending money on, on fighting wildfires. We've got huge opportunities, I think, to invest in the short-term restoration that's there and utilize the byproduct from that restoration in very creative ways, one of which is biomass energy thinning the understory of that forest, not in a, not vacuuming the forest floor, just doing sound cleanup of the forest stand conditions, dealing with that overstocking that affects understory vegetation, that affects forage for bighorn sheep and elk, that affects water tables for in-stream water and temperature and fish, that affects everything. We can reduce those overstockings and we can convert that material into thermal energy, electrical energy. We can heat our schools, which we do in Enterprise. We heat it with fuel reduction from, from the Willow Whitman National Forest. And it's a huge win-win if we can all buy off on it. So we have our program of work, again, is similar to what you saw with, with Melanie. The watershed stewardship is, is both public and private land. It starts with this big public land collaboration. We do watershed assessments uh, with all the stakeholder groups, pulling in people that have historically uh, fought each other about the direction for public land management, agreeing on a five to seven year plan of action within a particular watershed and then implementing that work. But we also work with private landowners on noxious weed control, on uh, river restoration, on uh, aspen restoration, wetland restoration, what, whatever it may be. We in, we've invested, and this was borrowing from Melanie, uh, the sort of flip-flop learning from each other. We invest a lot in education and research. We've built a, a strong K through 12 education program that allows kids to get outside and learn about our own place uh, and our own role as stewards. We work with universities. Uh, we have an ongoing program now with Whitman College and with OSU with their graduate students. And then we've designed a research program to invite graduate students in to do research on uh, uh, pressing questions that help influence our program looking at the impact of our investments or some of these larger scale changes that, uh, that we need to respond to, one of which uh, Jesse Abrams, some of you may know, worked on in terms of the, the change in land ownership, land ownership management objectives, and the relationships between adjacent landowners as new landowners came in, and how that affected our ability to look at uh, larger, larger landscape scale collaboration. Then we invest in business development and with Sustainable Northwest leadership and, and Maya and her team with, with community policy work. So we now, we now run a collaborative weed management program called the Wallowa Canyonlands Partnership, uh, which uh, manages over a million acres of Wallowa County, spills a little bit into a Soton County, Washington. Uh, it, in, it involves biocontrols. So these are our high school students collecting Yellow Star biocontrol agents, it involves burning, it involves spraying, uh, 
uh, throughout state lands, federal lands, and, and private lands. We do collaborative forest management. Um, we finished two watersheds now uh, that involves, uh, as I said, a program of work that uh, has opened up 38 miles of native steelhead habitat, clearing fish passage barriers, uh, dealing with forest stand conditions, dealing with aspen restoration, decommissioning uh, uh, roads that were no longer needed, et cetera. We've also invested a lot in renewable energy. Um, I mentioned biomass. I mean, there's a clear opportunity, particularly in biomass thermal, uh, but we've also looked at microhydro opportunities. Willow County has uh, an incredible uh, terrain for microhydro and existing irrigation ditch systems. So we're looking at the potential for uh, microhydro within irrigation ditches that already are, are below fish screens. Uh, so this is not dealing with live fish bearing waterways. This is dealing strictly with irrigation ditches that have a tremendous amount of resource potential and with it, particularly where there's, there's already some kind of pipeline infrastructure, but even without it, putting in turbines that allow them at a minimum to offset their irrigation pumping costs. Uh, now that may not sound like a lot to you, but I can tell you there's a farmer that lives two miles from our office that spends $100,000 a year on irrigation pumping, right? And we can offset all of that with a pressurized pipe, right? And that's one farmer. Um, so we're, we're looking at continuing to expand that ability and then using both solar PV and, and, and solar thermal. To date, we've installed about 28 gigawatt hours worth of capacity. It, it translates to about $2.4 million annually in saved energy expenses with, within the county. And I, and I mentioned research and education already, so I won't go into more detail. Um, for us, you know, uh, our program as a small community-based nonprofit today supports about 54 jobs. In Willow County, that's about 2% of the non-farm workforce translated to Portland. I think, I don't know what the number is, but it's something on a per capita basis, one job in Willow County is somewhere between 250 and 300 jobs in Portland, metro area. So it's like 13, 14,000 jobs in Portland, if you can imagine that. Uh, and, um, you know, it, it, it is significant within our small communities. Um, over our 16 years, we've had $13 million, that's, there's no million there, $13, $13 million of direct investment. That would be a great multiplier. Uh, $13 million of direct investment in Willow County. Um, and through an OSU study, because we're a place-based organization using as much as possible local contractors, local business supply companies, uh, so that money circulates, you know, they believe that, it's, that there's easily well over $20 million worth of benefit to our county from this work today. But sort of getting back to where, my, to where Melanie left us, and this is my, the end of my thing, is as I said at the beginning, that this transformation. So we have tried to create a model, design a model, demonstrate that it works, but there's this critical need to scale it up, multiply it, and accelerate the pace of change. Because in the absence of that, we lose capacity, we continue to lose workforce capacity, equipment capacity, mills, et cetera. But we also erode the support, particularly the political support, that is impatient, right? And, and there is, you can't, you can't rest on your laurels and just wait for everything to fall into place and everything to be perfect. We gotta be willing to take some risks and we need to take risks together. And it, and it I, I think that's sort of the essential thing for, for me is it's so far past the time for us to debate what to do. It's now, what is it from Ecclesiastes, right? There's a time to cast stones and there's a time to pick up stones together. And it's time to stop throwing stones at each other and it's a time to start working together. Otherwise, we lose this incredible momentum and desire that, that exists 
and something else is going to happen. And as I told my board, that's the only reason I'm going to leave, right? If our place turns into a high-end amenity recreation place or a service center with prisons and call centers, that's not where I want to be, right? But if we can stay true to this vision and, this, and the potential, this is a place for life for me. But we can't do that alone. We need to have the partnerships. So if you didn't feel inspired when you walked in, I hope you do now. Um, some of the most cutting edge work happening in rural America uh, with both of these organizations. And so I'm just going to open the floor up to you guys. We have about 10 minutes for Q&A. If you'll come up to the podium, and if you could say your name and just, you know, a little bit context for them about where you're coming from, that would be great. My name is Andy Stone. I don't have any context. I'm curious what partnerships, uh, if you give me some examples, what you're looking for, what you think would be advantageous. Sure. So, uh, you know, I, I think it's across multiple levels, but I mean, clearly it starts with, um, in our public land communities, um, moving beyond um, some of the ongoing debates about um, what level of active management or is appropriate or not on the public lands. So we, we need to work together and have a more united voice that gives um, the, the space to operate to the Forest Service again. That direction is not coming from Congress, right? Congress is divided. But if we are united in Oregon and the Wallow Whitman National Forest is hearing a united voice from multiple stakeholders in Oregon that they want to see this type of work done and, and that they're okay with certain types of, of forest management and harvest, you know, within the context of the process that I laid out, et cetera. That's, that's a huge first step, right? Because today they're still, uh, they're still handcuffed through the NEPA process and the, in the public consultation process. They're getting feedback from everybody, pulling them in a gazillion different direction, and they're stuck in inaction. In uh, if, if they knew that we all agreed on this direction, it would facilitate the investment of their financial resources and their, and their, and their staff time, and we would get a lot more done. So that would be number one. The second thing would be to look at how do we create value that the, the markets for ecosystem services uh, seem very distant uh, and inaccessible to our community today. The concept that, uh, resonates, but, but it seems, um, it, you know, it, it doesn't seem likely to translate into a, an actual tangible incentive to individual landowners today. Somehow we need to change that because the, the, the real estate value of most of our farm and forest land is three or four times the production value today, right? From a well-managed forest, cutting timber, doing whatever revenue they can get on an annualized basis over whatever frame you want to look, it's three or four times less than if you sold it out to a developer and, and let them put some fancy home on it. So how do we, and, and I will tell you, you don't need to make that one-to-one -one because there are s other social values family values, cultural, you know, there's a whole bunch of other things. But you need, to, you need to reduce that differential. And somehow we need to figure out how do we create value, how do you reward people for well-managed rangelands and that produces the beef that we want. Like, like we do have in Oregon with country natural beef and, and a whole slew of other uh, grass-fed beef marketing schemes, branded beef schemes. But, we need to keep pushing on those values, and we need to look at like the work that um, the Willamette Coalition has done, uh, looking at rewarding uh, biodiversity habitat and the ability for riparian habitat to contribute to cold water and reward those landowners in, in, uh, rather than just paying for uh, big institutional infrastructure. 
You know, somehow we need to work on, on that piece together. I think those are the two biggest things, right? How, how do we create value to private land? How do we provide a united voice that, give, that empowers the Forest Service to get back into the game of stewardship of the public land? I guess I'll just echo those two. We have, um, you know, our sort of immediate downstream urban community is Missoula, Montana, and so we have a public lands project that, um, you know, super well designed project meets all of our sort of tri we call it triple bottom line social, economic, and um, environmental values, and it's in Lynx critical habitat, and um, it was litigated. And normally we would just throw up our hands and say, "Oh my gosh," and you know, cry in our soup. And instead, we got 27 entities, um, individuals, powerful, influential individuals in Missoula, groups in Missoula, um, our. Um, own stakeholders, 27 of us filed an amicus brief, and it was a tremendous, um, not only successful technique, but also just made everyone feel like, wow, our, we have a partnership, like we're supported in this new way that we're trying to do things. Um, so that's one tangible thing. And then the second is also to echo your point about private landowners. For us right now, we have private landowners that are managing grizzly bear habitat, lynx habitat, bull trout habitat living with wolves, and really the only tangible way you can get paid for those values right now um, in any way is a conservation easement. And there just has to be more tools in the box than that um, for a lot of reasons. So I echo that as well. That's, I mean, to give really tangible things on that, I mean, that's the, amongst the recent controversies we have in Milan County is wolves, right? And the land that, it's been divisive because we didn't have the right tools and the ability to build this partnership. And so the people within the livestock producer community that, or, or the ideas where maybe we could tolerate them if there was an honest recognition of the cost borne by the individual producers, weren't really appreciated by society at large and by at least the, the voices and messages we heard. So we became, you know, Minority groups and, and, and groups that feel under pressure get this siege mentality where we need to defend, we need to defend ourselves and we lose the ability to be creative and collaborative in, in that context. Um, but if there was a more honest understanding that yes, okay, society has decided, a larger society than ours decided we wanted wolves back on our landscape, but it's a very small set of individuals that are disproportionately bearing the cost of that how do we reward them? How do we compensate them? How do we address their fears and concerns in an appropriate way rather than a dismissive way? And I just want to, because he's an economist and I'm not, um, you know, what I hear over and over again from ranchers and others is, is that appreciation piece. I mean, there's hard economic realities for sure. I think what really puts our community in siege mentality is the lack of appreciation for the fact that you know, food can be grown sustainably, beef can be grown sustainably, timber can be harvested sustainably, water can be, you know, yada, 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 yada. And so that, that's a big part of what I would answer your question is just helping us grow that appreciation for sustainably, locally, regionally produced stuff. So. Thanks. Looks like we have a second question. Yeah, my name is Dushica Evremovic, and um, I, it seems that I come to these seminars and I keep asking very frequently one question uh, that is related to all people uh, from, I'm curious to hear their perspective. Yesterday I was uh, um, at EcoTrust, there was Earl Blumenauer talking about and then Imhoff talking about the farm bill. I, I went to, to listen uh, Blumenauer in 2006 or 2007 when he really fought for some conservation easements for small and mid-sized farmers, which was pretty small victory. But now he's really pushing for something very important in Farm Bill uh, to change it really um, substantially. And he was talking yesterday and it is just uh, fascinating when he spoke how much one dollar 
of federal or government money goes on conservation of land is less than six cents, and all yeah. other things goes to uh, incentives and to ins crop insurances. And he also found understands completely how the schemes exist now, what farmers do to get insurance money. I mean, not to talk all that thing, but. Uh, he is asking for support of, of people now. He is asking for, like, talk to churches, to schools, to businesses, to everyone, uh, to people, to uh, start thinking about the Farm Bill and supporting. There will be whole there will be, uh, website and uh, environmental, I don't know exactly, some organization will craft the, the letter that they hope that it will publish in a, Washington Post, and you know they're, they're seeking uh, support of people, of ordinary people, to be able to uh, put emphasis on small. And I mean, their idea is that emphasis and the money should revitalize the small and mid-sized farms and take money from those big, huge, uh, corporative uh, enterprises. So, what might be your role? in all that, and do you have some kind of a, a connection with the farm bill and money coming, and may you be, a, can you have some uh, benefits if you join to that fight of Earl Blumenauer for some Let kind of new farm I'll bill? Sure, um, Melanie will answer. I will also just say that on the Sustainable Northwest website, we do have our farm bill position paper. We've also sent a letter to the committee expressing what we think our priorities are on the Farm Bill, um, the Rural Voices for Conservation Coalition, we've been working on that issue. So yet yesterday, uh, Congressman Blumenauer had a talk over at EcoTrust, and I think there's a lot of energy generated around that. But we are definitely involved in the Farm Bill effort. So Absolutely. And I mean, just a tag team on that, to get to beyond the Farm Bill, the point that you're making, I, I think, I, at least in my work, and I think in Nils's work and, and Lynn's work and a lot of our work, scale matters, right? And so where you put your investment, um, uh, and we, you know, there's research and there's data, and then there's just, we, we know it, we see it. So investing in um, strategies for the small and micro businesses, small and micro landowners, all that kind of stuff um, has more transformative power in general than investing in sort of the large mega options. Um, so wherever we find ourselves, whether it's with farm bill programs or all, a myriad of others, um, we're sort of always on point with that message. Absolutely. So are there, we're a little bit over, I think we were only supposed to go to 6.30, is that right? Um, so Patrick, is that correct? Till um, 7. So we have plenty of more time for questions. Um, are there any here. further questions? Here comes Don Harker. I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about um, Jesse Abrams' research on who's buying and who's owning you know, these rural places and how you see that kind of impacting Wallowa County, but I'd also be interested in what's going on in uh, Swan Valley as far as you know, ownership patterns. So, Jesse Abrams, for those of you who don't know, um, is, I got his PhD at Oregon State University and is now working at Whitman, Whitman College. Whitman College. Yeah. So. so, yeah, Jesse was an intern with us and then did his master's and, 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 and his master's translated into a PhD that was looking at this question of uh, land ownership, demographic change in, in rural communities, land ownership change. Uh, and how that change affected uh, the objectives of land management and cross-fence line collaboration. Um, and you know, Don put me on the spot because it's been a while since I read it. So I may, not, I may not hit everything you wanted to hear, but uh, you know, one thing became clear is that um, there, you know, we, we could debunk a few myths. He helped us debunk some myths about uh, what seemed to be local stories, local drivers that were 
affecting this rising differential in the value of land from its productive value. Uh, so for example, you know, ranchers uh, were exasperated that dry land, ranch land, which has a productive value of $200, $215 an acre, can be sold for $11,000 an acre. Um, and um, Jesse looked beyond our county at counties across the Intermountain West and found not the same prices, but the exact same pattern. I mean, if I showed you the graph, it's phenomenal. It's the, you know, all these counties moving exactly together, peaking together, dropping together. And then he began to look nationally at why. Uh, and, and clearly, part of the answer, I mean, all the answers are, are complicated, but part of the answer was that with, uh, there was a huge bump in value with the dot-com bust, uh, people beginning to diversify their portfolios, looking at ways to balance risk, uh, and deciding, and not just sophisticated individual investors, but pension funds, university endowments, you know, everybody looking at ways to diversify risk and, and improve and, and maintain a more uh, consistent return on their investment and began to buy farmland and forest land um, acro across America and, and to some extent now, you know, in, in Africa and, and other places. Um, within, within our county, you know, the, it, I mean, I think all the stories are, are varied. I mean, we have uh, large national environmental organizations. We have uh, high net worth individuals. Uh, we have TMOs, uh, timber, in, timber investment management organizations. Um, but you know, underneath that, obviously, there's the small scale. You know, they're the basically the yuppies, or you know, people that can be. I think we call them lone eagles. People that can export their job and live in a beautiful place take advantage of IT and, and work remotely, telecommuting jobs. Um, so we've got a pretty varied story, and, and when it came to land management objectives and collaboration, it was very varied too, right? Um, it, you know, for some people, there was an increased investment in restoration, stewardship, and, and all the infrastructure that supports that. For others, there wasn't, and there was a neglect and, and, a, and a large, ignorance about noxious weeds and a whole range of things. Um, probably the thing that makes me most nervous is the breakdown in relationships uh, that allow for, you know, sort of common fence repair that are understanding of minor trespass for various reasons when stock escapes or if you're hunting with your family and an animal jumps over the fence and you're finishing your hunt and you know, some of the things that were um, accepted within the community by people that knew each other and went to church together, went to school together, et cetera, become more problematic and more, and, and there's more legal confrontation today. Um, so those are challenges for us. I don't know that I answered your question. Well, we have, yeah. You guys know each other, so you can follow up later, too. Out of, out of county ownership has increased dramatically. You know, we went from 12% uh, of our properties owned by uh, non-residents to 30 some percent of the county owned by non-residents. And then uh, when you eliminated the large lands, and so you eliminated the forest in industrial land and, and tribal lands and everything, and you just looked at the private family lands, the absentee ownership actually went up to over 50%. Uh, and so that has a huge impact on our school populations, on who's there to buy things on, on Main Street, you know, uh, stores, et cetera. So I think Thanks we've got somebody problem. waiting, yeah, for a question. So I, I know you mentioned briefly, or you touched on conservation easements, um, saying you need more tools in the toolbox than just that. I was wondering, with your respective states here in Oregon and then in Montana, what kind of public infrastructure, if any, is involved in the conservation easement process? I come from a background in Colorado where there was a significant amount of public infrastructure around conservation easements, and I saw a lot of really good 
um, benefits come out of that. It creates, you know, even a lot of value beyond the easement itself is created in communities around that. And I was wondering if you could speak to that. Well, I think the way I'm going to speak to that is to say what is public invest or what, what I don't even know what that is. Public infrastructure on sure. conservation easements. Um, All I know is private NGOs, basically. Well, in, I guess in Colorado, it, it's a significant amount, and it's roughly 80% of lottery funds are put into a trust fund that leverages private land trust donation or however it's it's raised to uh, to place uh, lands under contract. Basically concert. matches it? Absolutely. Yeah, it's matching funds. No, we don't have anything like that. There's nothing like that in either <laughs> no. of the states? <laughs> there, um, so I'm not an expert in this. For In Oregon and in eastern Oregon, Willow County actually has even more strict land use laws than the rest of Oregon. Um, and, and because we have those land use laws in place, it diminishes some of these values that go into calculating easement values and, and diminishes, therefore, the demand, the market demand for easement. Mm -hmm. um, but within the county, um, I, I know the Oregon Watershed Enhancement Board, through the state lottery funding, has paid money to easements uh, in certain circumstances. The largest one that I know of is the, the easement that the Nature Conservancy took out on the Zumwalt uh, Preserve. I mean, and just one other point I'd like to add. It, beyond even the easement taking place, um, what I saw was infrastructure being built around it. So if a large ranch was preserved, say, in Park County, Colorado, what you saw was a tourism influx based on the ability to, to fish on those private easements in a small capacity that wasn't doing, obviously, any, uh, wasn't causing any harm to the ranch itself. But that influx then brought in additional dollar amounts to those particular counties. And, and granted, there's an accessibility to larger uh, urban areas in that context, so it doesn't, you know, it's not apples to apples comparison, but I'm wondering if there's something there, you know, long term that may be worth looking into some lobbying potential or, or even just bringing it up at a, at a, at a community level, you know? Yeah, we certainly so. see that effect, but we don't really have a, a robust public engagement in it, but certainly where private landowners have entered into block management um, agreements and tied up a river corridor or whatever and provided higher level, you know, fishing, higher quality fishing, recreation, whatever, then the county sees. I mean, we have tracked some of those trends. It's just I don't resonate with the actual public infrastructure piece of it. So, yeah, as much. So, yeah. So, probably one more question, if there is one. Brief so my answers? Brief answers? <laughs> oh, that would be you. <laughs> so my name's Karen Hardig, and I, uh, I'm based out of here, but I work in Alaska. And I've long admired the work that um, you've done, Nils and Melanie and Lynn, in these sort of conservation, the what you said, conservation, restoration, innovation, and education. And for someone who really has felt for a while that an entity like those both of yours and the Watershed Research Training Center is really needed in Southeast Alaska to catalyze and plate do that place-based collaborative conservation and transformative change and all those good things. You both have been at this for 15 years. What would you say to someone who says they want it? And if I were crazy enough to go do, not that I'm going to, but or someone to say start a group like this, what would you advise? after your 15 years, mm -hmm. both in terms of maintaining your energy and... and well, the first thing you have to do, Karen, is meet Aaron Steinkruger over here and Kathleen know, from I NFF. Know. There's all these people here around Southeast Alaska work, so you guys have to like have a breakout session after this and get this thing going. Um, and you know, I mean, it's just, I just have stupid tried advice, like if you want it, do it. You know, just figure it out, Get find, make, build relationships with three people and go from there. I mean, there is no magic formula. You guys in Southeast have a whole different, I mean, that, uh, something you said, Nels, really resonated and I'm too tired to remember exactly what it was, but I think it was um, the idea that every, every one of these solutions, wait, I wrote it down, solutions that are specific to place. I mean, it's so simple but environmental solutions that, can't, that they're going to be specific to place. So you guys in Southeast, you have your, your whole own history of, of um, conflict, of, you know, the geography dictates so much, the players. Um, so, you know, you've got to make it up on your own, but just do it. 
Um, <laughs> I, so for me, it's been, you know, it's been incredibly rewarding, exciting work that it motivates me every single day that I've done it. Um, it um, it's not for everybody because it's slow. Uh, it can be really frustrating. It's very hard. It's not always very rewarding. Uh, so you have to, you know, you've got to have sort of a, a big picture in mind uh, and, a, and a long time frame to do it. Um, so I, I think if you're, you know, if you're persistent and patient and, and willing to just go ahead and get started, you know, and, and recognize, I think, as was just said, it's, it's better while you're building relationships and, and building this big old, bigger circle that's buying in, into the, a collective vision or not buying into it, but collectively framing a vision and owning that vision, that, you, that you're not waiting to finish that to start something, right? You start tinkering right away mm -hmm. and start learning things and, 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 dem and having some results that you can build on. Uh, because without that, it's hard to sustain the participation in this larger process um, and, 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 and build momentum. And just, um, it's, it's always been an interesting irony of the work that we do because we're so based on inclusivity and democracy, but there is an absolute art and skill to starting without inviting everybody to the table and really finding the players that have, you know, the will to get this thing going that represent diverse interests and that can go back to their constituencies and bring it in. Um, and so don't make the mistake of being too inclusive out of too much heart. So I will just add from a sustainable Northwest perspective, I think starting out, I think having the right players there, you know, collaborate early and often, um, go to those opinion leaders. I also think that it's important because it is a really long, slow, hard road. Um, I think that groups that have chosen to network with people outside of their community, that those leaders, that group of people that say, I have a different, there must be a better way, right? The Melanie PowerPoint. There must be a better way to create avenues for those individuals to connect with other people. Because otherwise, it is extremely exhausting um, for people. And you know, I do think there's a certain amount of reinventing the wheel that's necessary, because every place is different. But if you know somebody else also invented a wheel, you might invent one with a slightly different twist on it, which makes it work better where you are. Um, so plagiarism is really important in this field, you know, with your own little uh, thing on it. But with that, I think that these guys uh, have had a long day and looking out at all of you, been sitting quietly and engaging. So I'm going to let us break and thank them. And I think they'll hang out for a little bit if you want to talk to them one on one. Um, don't forget to put your information. So Renee, if you don't have a business card, is there actually a little card that you can fill out? Okay, so there's a little card you can fill out which is right next to the bag where you can put it in, I hope. Um, and keep in touch with us. And you know, also go to their websites. They update things. They have really good newsletters. Um, it's a lot of information to share. So thanks. Mm -hmm.